week. Oh, yeah. I was amazed this morning when you guys were singing and part of the song is about being happy and no one looked happy. Not this, not here, but when you're eating breakfast and you're all like, yeah, morning. Um, we want to make the most of this time. One of the things Randy uh, pointed out to me was that since I wasn't here on Sunday night, uh, I didn't really get to introduce myself very well. And so I wanted to take a little bit of time just to do that so you could know kind of where I'm coming from, who I am, and um, why I'm talking to you guys. So a little rundown of my life. Um, when I was growing up, I had a hamster. His name was Chucky, and he was big. And he would beat up my brother's hamster. And that was kind of cool because my brother is much bigger than me. Um, and then after that hamster period of life, uh, I grew up a little bit, got into high school, and I liked break dancing. That was one of my hobbies. I wasn't very good at it, but I collected lots of big pieces of cardboard and would go outside, and people in my neighborhood probably thought that I was really weird, but it was super fun, and we were like doing some construction stuff at the time, so cardboard was readily available, so it seemed like a providential thing, break dancing in high school. So if any of you guys want to get some good exercise and concern your parents, break dancing is a good direction to go into. Um, it's one of the things that, that I did. I was a part of Chehi. I've actually, this is actually my 15th year uh, coming to Chehi. I was a, a camper for a long time and a counselor and I've been the chapel speaker for uh, several years now which is uh, amazing to me that some of you guys aren't even 15 years old and I've been a, a part of this for that long. Um, so now I don't really do break dancing very much. Um, I like some other things like I like tennis and Taco Bell. Those are some of the the great things in life, if you want to be a sophisticated person, watch some tennis while eating a burrito, and like, you'll be like, man, this is living. This is what, what enjoyment is about. It's super fun. I went to college at uh, Liberty University and got a degree in worship and music studies, um, which was great, and then continued on in the seminary there, got a couple of graduate degrees, and now I'm working at uh, a small church that meets in a YMCA that has a really awesome vision for reaching people who have never heard or never really understood the good news about Jesus Christ. And so that, that's where I am now. Um, I work with the band and do a lot of discipleship stuff with the church in general and spend a lot of time with the middle school and high school students, which is one of the reasons that I really enjoy coming here and hanging out with you guys because it's another extension of, of one of the things that I feel that God has called me to do at this point in my life. And in all the different areas that I've, I've been able to work, one of the things that I've seen, one of the, the things that has become apparent for people who understand some of what God's Word has to say is a lot of people get the little stories in the Bible. Someone might be able to tell you the story of Daniel in the lion's den or how Jesus fed 5,000 people, but a lot of times people don't grasp that the Bible itself is not just a collection of little units, it's actually one major continuous story. The Bible from, from beginning to end is God's story uh, throughout history and it, it shows a lot of how he demonstrates his power and his love and his mercy to us. And so today we're going to kind of talk about what the Bible is as a whole and what it contains. And we are going to jump into some specific passages and I'll let you know when we turn there. But just to get this started, I want to start off at the beginning. And uh, you guys are probably aware that when the Bible starts, it says that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That, and the Bible goes on to say in several places that he created everything that there is out of nothing. That God came into... Um, this situation, and there wasn't like things to work with. He didn't build the earth out of existing materials, but just through the power of his word, he said it, and it was here. And that's a demonstration of ultimate power. He created this world to be intricate, showing his wisdom, how all these things work together so incredibly to allow uh, the systems that we live in to exist. 
that the world is the right distance away from the sun and the sun is the right distance away from another sun and, um, and that the universe is so grand and yet we, who seem so small in the cosmic picture, uh, can exist because of a lot of the systems that are perfectly put into place by God. That is phenomenal and it all points to him and the Bible says that the heavens declare the glory of God. It's almost like when you look around, whatever you see in the world shouts out that God is awesome because he is able to design amazing things. When you look up at the, the sky and you say, God put those stars there and God gave me the eyes so that I would be able to see them. He's incredible and, and whatever exists, whatever is here, um, exists to point to the power and the majesty and the awesome love of God. But he didn't just create a world, he also created us, mankind, and he put us here in his own image to know him, to experience him, and to, to be able to live and follow him, to have the kind of community with him that, that no one else can have. Uh, it's, it's phenomenal that, that God would do that. And, and not only did he call us to know him, but to also to be a part of his process. If you look at uh, the creation story, God names man. He says, you know, I'm going to call you Adam. And then he gives Adam the responsibility of going out and naming all the animals. It's awesome how God doesn't just allow us to know him, but he actually allows us to be a part of what he wants to accomplish here. He allows us to have responsibility in, in being part of building his kingdom here on earth. And he, he created men to walk with him, to know him, and to have this perfect relationship with him, not, not smeared by sin or, or broken by shame, but, but perfect. Because there's no barrier between uh, man and him until man fell. You know, the Bible uh, talks about how uh, Adam and Eve were, were deceived and that they were willing to disobey God. And this idea of sin, this reality uh, of disobedience came into the world that, that Satan caused Adam and Eve to doubt the character of God, doubt whether he was really good and whether his plans for them was really good. And be, once they were doubting his character, they turned and they, they chose to disobey him. God's perfect design, not meant to hold them down or hold them back or diminish their joy. But they chose to go against his will and do their own thing. And, and this destroyed the perfect relationship that man had with God. And pain and struggle and evil entered the world. And we've all experienced those things. We've, we all have different life experiences, but we've all seen those things, whether... Um, You've experienced a heartache or pain or health problems or, or uh, just any kind of personal struggle. You know what that is, that's like to, to just experience the results of sin being rampant in this world. But what's awesome is that God didn't just leave us here. He didn't just leave us on our own. The Bible continues to talk about how even though mankind, even though people like us are so unfaithful and so disobedient and so easily distracted, God remains faithful to us. Throughout the Bible, we can see that God consistently rescues his people. In fact, if, if you define the Bible or you just want to describe it to somebody who didn't know anything about the Bible, it might be completely appropriate just to tell them that the Bible is a rescue story where God rescues people who are in desperate need. If you think through the Old Testament, you can see that God rescued Noah and his family. He rescued Lot. He rescued the Israelites from Egypt. And the, story, the stories could go on and on and on about how God took care of his people and brought his people out of dire and desperate situations uh, for his glory and for their good. Throughout the Bible, we can also see that God is seeking out his people that he calls us, he calls individuals to follow him and that the Bible is an invitation for people like you and people like me to walk closely with God. It tells the story of Abraham leaving his homeland and everything he knew behind in order, in order to walk with God and, and experience something greater, something better. It calls David a man who's, who's chasing after God's own heart, a, God, a man who, who wants to know and follow God and, and be close to Him. 
God is seeking people like that. In fact, the Bible says that, that you know, he's like looking around the whole world for people like that. You know, for people who, who will follow him. And the, the Bible also talks about the fact that God is restoring people. That no matter how far his people run away or how often they turn away, that he calls them back. There's awesome stories that demonstrate that, whether it's the story of Hosea in the Bible or what's, what the Bible talks about in Judges, where people would go and do what was right in their own eyes and, and they would turn far away from God and then God would bring them back to himself and he would restore a right relationship between uh, himself and his people, which is really awesome. And, and the Bible contains all of those things. The Bible is amazing in other ways in that it can also be a mirror that we can look in to see who we really are. You know, we, we like to associate ourselves with the heroes of the Bible when we read it. Um, we like to say, well, if David slayed the giant, so can I. But the Bible doesn't actually teach us like that. What the Bible says is that God is the hero who does the rescuing, not us. We are the ones who need him. So you guys might have heard the story of, of David and Goliath, of how he goes out um, to, to deliver some stuff to his brothers, and he sees Goliath taunting his people and taunting God and just throwing insults all around. And David, you know, will, will go out there and, and stand up to, to the giant because he sees that all the mighty men who are following God are just cowering and they're afraid. And we like to think, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to be like David. But much of what the Bible teaches is that we are the people who are desperate, we are the people who are cowering, and we are the people who need a hero to come and save us from the things that are too big, the things that are too strong, the things that are too powerful for us to overcome ourselves. And that's what God accomplishes in our life. We aren't the ones who slay the enemy. That's Jesus. And in the Bible, and in reality, and in our lives, Jesus is the ultimate hero, and that's one of the big reasons that we celebrate this thing called mercy. And the entire story of humanity could really be defined as an epic. God could have wiped us out the first time we sinned. We deserved it. He's just. When you make a mistake, when you do something wrong, when you disobey and dishonor and go against the will of God, He has every right. Every right to respond um, by justly punishing us. But the Bible tells of time after time after time where the, the ground doesn't swallow up the people and that God doesn't just annihilate people for, for disobeying him, but it, it tells how we get mercy even though we don't deserve it. And this mercy is demonstrated in so many ways. I mean, you can think about, you know, why doesn't our evil intent and our destructive habits always lead us, why, why don't they always lead us down the most painful roads possible? Why sometimes do we do the wrong things and it, it works out okay? And that's because we have mercy. And wh why doesn't the ground just swallow us up? And that's because God gives us mercy. We, sh we should have had this kind of punishment coming to us, you know, even to the extreme sense, even to to the fact that we deserve, the Bible says, to pay the consequences of our sin, to, to go to hell and be separated from God forever because of who we are, because of what we've done, because of our nature, and yet God doesn't want that for us. Instead, he wants to show us mercy. And that's demonstrated most clearly in the Bible through Jesus Christ. And it's not an oversimplification to say that Jesus Christ is the mercy of God. And think about the gospel itself, that, that the perfect judge chooses not to sentence us, sentence us, but instead he chooses to take our punishment on himself. He took our place, and that is extreme mercy. And if you think about the almighty and the invincible God chose to become weak and poor in order to reach us, he, he stooped down for you. That is incredible mercy. He came to us. He lived among us. He died for us. That's amazing mercy. The Bible teaches that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Not when we were good, 
Not when we cleaned ourselves up, not when we had anything that we could offer him, not when we had started to turn ourselves around. The Bible teaches that while we were still stuck in our sin, Christ came and died for us. If you have a Bible, you can open it up to Ephesians chapter 2. And this is a really famous and well-known passage because it does a great job of demonstrating the depth of of the gospel for each one of us. And a lot of times we can become inoculated to the power of the gospel in our own lives because um, if you're in a place where you hear it a lot or where you've, you've been a Christian for a while and you just kind of get used to the, the story of the gospel, it can start to seem kind of normal to you. But the truth is there is nothing normal about the most amazing, most powerful person in history choosing to give up everything for people who literally without God are worth nothing. And yet he gives us this great value. He assigns this great worth to our lives because he says, I created you in my own image and beyond that I'm willing to die for you so that I can live with you forever. So let's start reading in, in, in Ephesians 2 verse 1 and it says this, Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. You used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature, by our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much, that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. And we're going to stop there and... And just think about some of what this says. And this is a huge statement. And we could be talking about this one passage all week. We're just going to take a little bit of time today to highlight God's mercy on display here. And In this passage, he says that by our very nature, we were subject to God's anger. The reality is that when God is angry with us, that's not like a fault on him. That's the right response to us doing evil and to us turning against him and to us being disobedient, disobedient and he should be angry. And don't you think that he has every ability to crush us? If God wanted to punish us, if God wanted to uh, pour out the ultimate of his wrath on us, he absolutely could do it. And the, what is holding him back from doing that is his mercy. Who we are without God is evil, and, and as a result of that, a just God has every right to judge us. And for any of us who think that we're good enough or that we've lived rightly enough to please God, we need to think again because this says that by our very nature, who we are, we are subject to God's anger. Your nature is not righteous. Your nature is not good. Your nature is not worthy of God's love. And yet, he shows us mercy anyway. And that is demonstrated in the fact that this passage says that God is so rich in mercy. And he loved us so much that he gave us life. This is amazing because he didn't have anything to gain in the sense that, that we had something to offer him. This passage says that we were evil, that we were against him, that we were following his enemy, that by our nature we were inclined to, to be disobedient to God. That's not somebody who like seems like a great candidate for friendship or to be adopted into, into God's family. And yet because he's so rich in mercy and because he loves us, because he loves you so much, He's willing to offer you life at the expense of his own. And this says that not, not only did God condescend to us, not only did he stoop down to this world, but he also 
raises us up to him, that he gives us eternal life, that he shows us grace and mercy, that, that he gives us this rescue which is absolutely undeserved, unearned. And when we think about it all, it is unimaginable. We couldn't have come up with it on our own. And, and this really should change the way that we live our lives. This really should change the way that you think. This should change the way that you act. This should change your priorities. Just think about a, a few of the ways that this touches on us. First of all, if this is true, if the gospel is real, if God's mercy is, is a reality in your life, it should kill your pride. Have you ever tried to think that you're better than someone else? And then recognize that in your, on your own you are dead in sin, that you are destined for death, that you are an enemy of God. That doesn't leave very much room to be like, man, I am great. I am better than this other person. The gospel absolutely annihilates our ability to think that, that we're better than anyone else. And it, it, it destroys our capacity to think that we deserve anything. The gospel of God's mercy to us wasn't given to us because we earned it. It's so clear that he didn't say that he loves us or that he saved us because we were special on our own or because we worked really hard or we did some of the right things or we said some magic words. And it says that, that we can be saved because he demonstrates mercy to us. Not because of our great worth, but because of his. In addition to destroying our pride, it puts our sin into the right perspective. We talked a little bit yesterday about the nature of sin and what it, what it does, how it destroys our lives. Here's another perspective on sin to, to kind of add to that and to illustrate what sin actually does. And The fact is, if, if God was willing to do what he did to go to the cross to pay the price for our sins, we can't play games with it anymore. We can't feel free to dabble in something that cost the Son of God his life. There's no little sin. And this gospel of mercy should cause us to hate sin and to strive to run away from it at every opportunity that presents itself. And when we think about sin, a lot of times when you think about the nature of, of temptation, you think about it like, like this, that... The temptation is an opportunity for you to fail. Temptation is an opportunity for you to disobey God like Adam and Eve did, like we talked about a few minutes ago. But there's another side to temptation. So if you have another opportunity, not just to turn away from God, but you have the opportunity to turn away from the call of sin. You have the opportunity to say no to your own sinful desires. You have the opportunity to turn away from what the devil would want you to do. Temptation is not, an, not only an opportunity for us to turn away from God, but temptation is an opportunity for us to worship God by saying, God, I recognize that sin and, and I know that I'm inclined to do it, but I want you more. What the gospel of mercy should accomplish in our life it's putting sin into perspective and for us to see that it is, it's not just damaging for us, but, but it cost the Son of God greatly to redeem you, to save you from sin, and to be able to bring you into, our, into His family. In addition, and this is awesome for us, mercy demonstrates that we now have a mission and a purpose in this life that we couldn't get on our own. And if you look around in the world, you will see people living for all kinds of things. You'll people, you see people defining success in many different ways, whether that's in prestige or money or popularity or comfort. People all want this, these kind of things. People are looking for safety, security. People are looking to stand out or to make some kind of significant difference. But in reality, all of those things don't matter at all if they're not following Christ. Because whatever you do in this life is just going to pass away. It doesn't matter what you get. It doesn't matter what you earn. It doesn't matter how many people like you. All that stuff's going to be gone. 
And the one thing that lasts is, is our relationship with Christ and what is done for Him and with Him. And so now, because of the gospel, we have the opportunity to share and show the good news, to make a difference for the kingdom of God, to uh, spread this story of mercy that we've been given. Every other endeavor pales in comparison. All other accomplishes and success, all the status that you could gain, all the pleasure that you could experience are worthless when compared to knowing the surpassing greatness of Christ. And for those of us who have truly experienced His mercy, we should be absolutely compelled to share it. The Old Testament talks about how um, it can be like the feeling of having a fire shut up in your bones and that you actually have to go out and, and tell about God because there's, there's no other option for you. Mercy should compel us like that. And if we aren't having this desire to go share with other people what, what Christ has done for us, what Christ has accomplished for us, the great mercy that he's shown to us, we might need to examine whether or not we really have accepted the truth. We might need to examine whether we are really people who have experienced the mercy of God. Because it's not something that we can just take and add into our lives. But the gospel is something that ultimately and completely transforms us. That the old is gone and something completely new takes its place. And now it's time for us to advance the story. We've kind of reviewed what happened from creation to the cross and we've landed on and expounded on mercy a little bit. But the story actually keeps going. And we have the opportunity to be key players in the rest of it. If you read the, the book of Mark, it starts out by saying something along the lines of, this is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when you read something like that, a lot of times for us, we're reading a book and we're like, oh, this is like a Bible-y way of saying, once upon a time there was a dude named Jesus. But that's actually not what's going on here. There's different... Um, ones of the Gospels that start in ways that would demonstrate that that would be an appropriate way to think about it. Some of the Gospels start with genealogies, talking about where Jesus came from. One of the Gospels starts way back in the beginning and starts talking about the eternal nature of God. But the book of Mark starts with Jesus as a man. It starts in a completely different area, and, uh, and this shows to us that it's not like this once upon a time type of intro. If it were, it would have started with creation or genealogies or, or the eternal nature of God like the other Gospels. But here, it seems to be saying something else. It seems to be saying that what Jesus accomplished, what Jesus did, is the beginning of the Gospel story, the story of the good news demonstrated to the world. And the Gospel started with Jesus' life and death and resurrection, but the story of the gospel actually continues through the life of the church. The story of the gospel actually continues with the, the redemptive pattern um, that, that Jesus continues to accomplish through his people. And the gospel's power can be seen when he saves you from sin. The gospel's power can be seen when Jesus turns you around and makes you into a new person. That's incredible. And the power of the gospel, the story of mercy, is now as advanced through this world as it continues to change lives. And this, the sad state of the United States, especially right now, is that people seem to think that Christianity is... Many people seem to think that it's kind of a joke. That it's just an old, dead thing. That people are stuck in a, an old mythology or a set of... Uh, ancient morals that just hold people back, that people need to move on and, and get past. And a lot of that stems from the fact that people aren't seeing that the gospel actually changes your life. People aren't seeing that when you are a follower of Christ, you're different. That now you love well. Now you have a desire to serve other people. Now uh, you want to share what Jesus is accomplishing in you, what he's done in your life. People don't see that. Oftentimes, you wouldn't even know in your everyday life, in your schools, or wherever you're at, who's a follower of Jesus and who's not. That's sad. 
not just for us personally, not just for the state of the, the church in the United States, but for the people who don't know Christ. How are people going to believe something that doesn't look believable? And to be completely honest, it's hard for some people to believe that somebody who is dead could come alive again. That's a big stumbling block. That's a difficult thing. We don't want to add to that by saying it's hard to believe that, that God rose from the dead, but also, it's, in addition, it's hard to believe that that matters in my own life because you're not actually seeing a difference in how I live. And the sad thing is that a lot of us add to the difficulty of believing in the gospel because people look at our lives and it, it just doesn't line up. It's just not consistent. We don't seem to demonstrate the same mercy that has been given to us. But now we need to understand that we have received mercy and that has to change us and that we need to go out and show it. That our number one priority now as followers of Christ is, get this, to actually follow Christ. That sounds so simple. But if you're a follower of Jesus, you actually have to live like he did. You have to put other people before yourself. You have to look at the advancement of the kingdom of God and, and sharing the good news as the ultimate goal of your life. Don't you think that Jesus could have come here and, and preached the word and, and done a lot of good things in, in ways that were much more comfortable for him or where he didn't have to get uh, so dirty or hang out with people that were so different from him or where he didn't have to be around people that were, seemed so hard-headed or people that he had to forgive so much? He could have done things in, in a number of different ways, but what God did was he saw needs and he met them. And he shared this reality by saying it's not healthy people that need a doctor, it's sick people. And for us, we need to recognize that we have been given the gospel, which Romans says is the very power of God for salvation for the people who believe it. That the gospel is the power of God for salvation. And you have it. And there are people all around who need it. And you have the ability to, to impact them, to change their life, to make a difference. And if we don't do it, we don't know who will. But further, beyond that, if we don't do that, are we really living for Christ? Is a person who reads the Bible and prays but doesn't have the priorities of Jesus really a follower of Jesus or just somebody who is a fan of his word? And for us, we need to be people who are inclined to share and to forgive and to serve and to demonstrate mercy at every opportunity. Because every chance that we get is a chance to advance this story, to continue what God started in the beginning. You in to his plan, that you're a part of it. That you're not some extraneous afterthought. But God wants to do great things here in this world, and he wants to, to grow his church, and he wants to save people from hell, and you are his plan for doing it. You are his plan for continuing the story of mercy in this world. And it's up to us to be a part of that. I'm going to close today by sharing with you guys one verse um, from Matthew 5, and it's pretty well known. And it, it says, The merciful are blessed because they will be shown mercy. Now I'd like to encourage you guys to be people who show mercy to others. That you would, you would recognize that that you are a part of this awesome story and this awesome process where God saves people who don't deserve it. You get to be a part of that. When you see your neighbors or your acquaintances or your friends or your classmates or your coworkers or whoever far away from Christ, those people are enemies of God. Those people are people who are, by their own nature, deserving of the wrath of God. But just like God did for you, he's offering them mercy. And you are his conduit for getting it there. 
So as we celebrate what Christ has done for us, we need to also go out so that we can celebrate what Christ does through us and what Christ does in the lives of the people around us. Let's pray. Dear God, we just thank you so much for your great mercy and for the way that you include us in your story and in your plan. And we ask that we would be able to see just how amazing the gospel is. And we ask that you would you'd allow that to transform the God, don't let us play games with sin. And God, don't allow us to be people who look at your gospel and who praise you for it, but are unwilling to have that be lived out in our lives as we love and serve and share with other people. We want to follow you. We want to be merciful like you are merciful. We want to love you with more than just our words and our songs. But we want to love you by being people who follow you. Help us to be people who live like you live. <clears throat> because that's how the gospel will continue to spread. And that's how people will continue to be saved. And that's how you will continue to get glory in this world. God, we thank you and we praise you. And we're excited to see what you're going to do in our lives through us and for your kingdom. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Thank you guys so much.